can go. All right, new one of those nonsense. So how are you, sir? I'm doing good, man. Living the dream, Living you know. The dream. How's sure. California treating you? I love California. I'm originally from the Midwest, and um, yeah, I love it out here. What um, Midwest? I'm from Wisconsin. What? What are you? Where are you? Home I'm state? from Wisconsin. Yeah, nice. I'm actually. I'm uh, right in between Chicago and Milwaukee, right on the okay. border, like the Gurney area. Yeah. I lived, spent some time in Kenosha. Okay. Um, okay. You know, uh, back and forth. Yeah. My dad was a Milwaukee boy, but I grew up closer to Green Bay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I shouldn't. I, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, realistically. Uh, <laughs> I was in, I was only in Wisconsin until I was seven. Yeah. Seven. And then we, then my parents made the, they kidnapped me basically and took me down to central Florida. <laughs> That's where most kidnappers take their victims. <laughs> um, but it, you know, as a kid, it was okay. As an adult, it was not for me. So I've been out here for 12 years now, did some other moving around before that, but I like in Seattle a lot. Can't afford yeah, to I live here it. much longer. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually when, uh, when we were going to move, it was either between C- Seattle or California. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my wife is originally from here, so made sense. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. made sense. So, how did you get your start? How did you start with? Were you an artist as a kid, or always? Yeah, uh, I you know started drawing when I was five. You know, I think every every kid does, but uh, you know, um, take my toys, and I remember buying dollar store toys just so I could cut them up and glue them back together with, uh, other toys. And, um, um, I was, I was thinking back to, to those days when I was thinking about this interview today and I remembered a, a toy that I did. You used to be able to buy these, um, dollar store Ken dolls. Right. Uh, and, uh, it was, uh, like a blow mold, cast of a body and then like a rubber head yeah and uh i forgot what i was trying to do but i remember i cut a a slit right across the the top of this one this one guy's head and i remember it was too deep and but when i pulled the blade out you couldn't see the the cut oh the the rubber healed the yeah i so when i when i pulled it out it was a perfect cut but but you couldn't see where where the slice was and um, I, I remember packing the, the head with some glow in the dark slime. Oh, nice. And when you when you squeezed it, like the slime would like come out of his oh, head. Yeah. yeah. I remember calling it lobotomy Larry. <laughs> I remember that was like one of one of my first customs. And then, you know, like when I started getting into like heavy metal, like when I found Guar. <laughs> Uh, nice. Like that, my my entire universe changed. Well, and um, as did most. I made, yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, mixing. Never look at penguins the same. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the way that they mix the music with the art so much. I remember even buying the CD uh, "America Must Be Destroyed." And just looking at the artwork and reading the lyrics before I even heard the music, well, you know, I bought it sight unseen. I never heard the music. Yeah. And I was like, I love this. Even if the music sucks. <laughs> Which sometimes like, it did. <laughs> no, I love this. Yeah, yeah. I know. But hey. But the they, show they can't, they can't all be winners. Yeah. yeah. Amazing shows. Um, and uh, so I remember I made guar toys. I, I remember I took like a bunch of uh, dollar store GI Joes. Right. Actually, this was um, one of my uh, claims to fame. When I was in eighth grade, I made there was like a there was a guar contest, the worthless slave uh, <laughs> contest, and um, I made uh, I turned a GI Joe. I made a, a GI Joe figure of every single oh wow uh, member of guar. And I sent that in and I won second place. I did not win the, the worthless slave. Well, you know, uh, but uh, I did get it's inside, but I did get like a, a big worthless slave award and it had like a gold seal stamp on it. And um, they sent me a bunch of swag and stuff. Oh, that's it's pretty awesome. But uh, so I said, you know, I'm an award winning toy maker since eighth grade, you know, Um. 
just just always making stuff, always putting stuff together. Yeah, my brother uh, did um, model mm. cars, and I used to make Mad Max vehicles out of them. I'd, you know, he would hand them to me when he was making his next one, and I'd tear it all apart and make Mad Max vehicles. <laughs> See, I, you know, it, it, it's weird because like sometimes it's it's like if there's directions on how to make something like a model, then I go, this is how you make this. Right. You know, it's sort of it's sort of like the like Legos. You know, if you get a Lego kit, here's my dog, oh. Laser. Uh, he's my mascot at the Barbarian <laughs> Rage Studios. But um, tax write off. It, it's a yeah, <laughs> exact dude now. There you go. Now you're talking. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like I was saying, like Legos, if if it comes with an instruction manual and says, this is how you build the Lego car, like that's just where my brain would go. Right. But if you just dump out a bunch of Legos and ha have at it, uh, you know, th then I could then I can get creative. So when you're saying like, you know, your brother would have a model kit and, and you would kit bash it like that never even really occurred to me huh uh, but you were you know, doing would, that with figures technically but that's that's because i i had the idea i, ha oh, I already had okay. the ending product gotcha and and the means to get there was was you know that was the process yeah okay um, okay so that, that makes a lot more sense. i just always always been making stuff it's not always toys you know it's puppets. I, you know, I had a huge fascination with puppets and, um, you know, I wanted to do makeup. I, I used to, I mean, I mean, uh, Rick Baker just put out uh, a book, uh, you know, and it's like yeah. a 15 pound tome. Um, and I listened to a bunch of interviews when he was, uh, doing some publicity for that book. And the, and the thing that I picked up on, on with that was every single interview that he did, the person that was interviewing said to him, I, this is what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Yeah. Everyone wanted to, to do makeup. And I, and I said, it's so crazy. Cause I remember like reading Fangoria magazine going, this, this is what I'm going to do when, when I get older. And, and I'm like, you know, is this just the thing that every kid wants to do? They want to apply Freddy Krueger makeup, you know? Um, so that's what I thought that I was going to do. Um, but, you know, uh, back then, you know, you say, where did I get my start? It was just, it was just keeping busy doing everything. You know, I used to make masks and puppets and toys and um, just all over the place. So starting materials, just a bunch of super glue and uh, random paints. <laughs> just whatever. Yeah. You know, um, tacky glue oh yeah I, I, that was a big i went through you know i've probably gone through a couple hundred gallons of tacky glue in yeah. my life Shoe glue. i remember um <laughs> when i was a kid my mom bought me a hot glue gun oh and uh i was making this mask uh it was like a wonder woman mask that i'd cut up and then i'd like paper mache this head around it and then i just started like putting hot glue all over the mask. My next door neighbor was a construction worker and uh, he comes over and he's chewing on a toothpick and he goes, well, that's a perfectly good waste of hot glue. <laughs> and I, I'm a little kid. I think. Right. Right. Thanks, bud. But then, you know, I, then I started painting it and, um, and it started to take form and I remember he came over and he was like, wow, that looks really cool. Yeah, you know, uh, I guess he just didn't see my vision of the hot glue. So, you know, now that's just one of the, it's just another tool in my arsenal. I still work a lot with hot glue in unconventional ways. Yeah, no, it's, it's a have to have item for any shop that does yeah. custom stuff. Um, when did you start getting into like mold making then? Um, you know, that happened a long time, t uh, a long time ago. I, um, when I dropped out of community college, uh, you know, I, um, 
I never did drugs or alcohol in high school. So then when I went to community college, it was like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and my second year I flunked out and I hated the America. Art. Yeah. <laughs> I hate, I hated the art curriculum there. It was not what I wanted to do. You know, at the time I wanted to do comic books and stuff and they had you drawing flowers and still lifes right. and I was too busy dropping acid and smoking bongs, uh, get loaded every night. Um, so after I dropped out, I, uh, I have a identical twin brother and we both dropped out at the same time. <laughs> Uh, we took acid one night and we're like, we're going to do this, man. We came up with the idea that we were going to make a animated short. Okay. We were going to make a, um, a clay animated stop motion animation. Right. Right. And, um, right around the liquid television era, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. It was right there. Yeah. 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 It was, um, right around 2000, yeah. uh, the early 2000s. And, um, you know, the, there was not a whole lot of books or maybe we didn't no. look really hard for, there, for books. I, don't, and, I can't think there was much out there realistically because people that were it, doing it had been doing it for years. And mm -hmm. it wasn't till that kind of, well, MTV generation that started doing that kind of stuff on their own. Yeah. You know, that wasn't classic art, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even before liquid television, like you had to seek that stuff. There was like a spike in Mike's yeah, the twisted film animation. Yeah. That's where like uh be a Vincent butthead came from. Right. And, right. Uh, you, you had to sort of seek that stuff out. Well, at the time, Wallace and Gromit had already been out and right. Ardman, um wrote a book on stop motion, which at the time was the, literally the only book. Yeah. On stop motion. And um, I don't think that the, even that there's a whole lot about mold making in there. And we what? sort That's of not all clay the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I, even there, we were like, you know, we need to figure out how to make these armatures. And Ardman is like, the way that you make an armature is you find this industrial art place and you just buy it from them. And I'm right. like, we're going, you know, the. Like it's only a thousand dollars an armature. And right. I'm going, oh my God, dude, that's the budget <laughs> for this entire thing. But, um, you know, so that was some rudimentary mold making plaster Paris. And I remember I made I, the, my first resin that I made, I cast it in, in plaster. I mean, it was a giant mistake. I, I ended up with a chisel and a hammer trying to, break it out of there and it was just this big yeah. uh, hunk it was my it was the first time i ever did a double cast i i built a skeleton right and then i i made something that i thought would it would it would fit in and it was it was this huge thing and you know i i have i have a problem with taking on projects that are way too big for me like this animation project yeah when I was in my twenties, you know, we spent years making the, the puppets and the sets and the, the props and everything. And we never, we never animated one second Oof. Uh, <laughs> of it. You know, we had spent, you know, a couple thousand dollars on right, it. Right. It was just this massive thing. And, you know, it was like, a, a the legend of Kenosha, Wisconsin was these guys, they've got this, this, animation set in their basement and it looked really cool we have a couple pictures and stuff but it, it, it never really happened so that was where i first sort of learned mold making was sort of what i had learned in high school which was not very much right um some simple so, cast stuff yeah yeah I mean, so the stuff that i do now it's um it's more advanced but even there, it, it was really hard. There's a lot of trial and error, expensive mistakes. And, um, you know, I even, I even did it again where I said, uh, you know, this is quite a few years ago. I was like, I have to make these toys. And I bought more silicone and I, I really tried to do it and just could not, it just wasn't taking. And I just said, you know what, I'm not making these toys. But then it was like a few years later, I was like, I, but I have to do this, you know? So I was like, 
Uh, you know, but even, even there, you know, I was making these big giant things. And when I, when I'm like, look, I have, I, I have to make toys. Right. And I was like, so I'm going to start with something so small and so easy that, you know, if I mess that up, then it, it's just not meant to be, you know? Right. So I did make something very small and easy and it worked. And, you know, that's my advice to everyone that's starting out is do something small and easy. Uh, you know, uh, no one ever listens to that advice, you know, cause everyone is like, well, I, I want to make a 12 inch He-Man. <laughs> I'm like, dude, dude, that's, it's not going to happen. You can't start with uh, Sobafu, you know? Uh, No, no, no. (laughs) Uh, That, I mean, uh, uh, the the Sofubi stuff is, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, that's why, like, sometimes I'll see someone on on Instagram, you know, they've got like three followers and they're like, here's my first Japanese vinyl. I'm like, (laughs) how did you, how'd you get that done, man? uh you know like i i do money I like, uh, well you know but it's also not just money it's also connections where yeah. there's a lot of uh uh japanese vinyl where you say like well i got my money i'm ready for my and they're like dude we're busy yeah you know the you know they're like we we've already you know we're booked up for the next five years there's and, a pretty um, decent place. Isn't there a couple places in like California or LA area that actually make them? Isn't there a couple? Not that I know. Of. Oh, I, thought there was. Um, I think that there's um, Mile High Safubi, I think is the only American. Okay. I, and I could be wrong, but you know, there again, Safubi is sort of like champagne unless it's made in champagne. Right. Right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, everything else is just sparkling wine. Safubi has to be made in Japanese. Otherwise it's just a soft final toy. Yeah. Um, but mile high Safubi, I think is, uh, somewhere in the Midwest. Okay. And, uh, I think they're one of the only Americans that, that do the, the soft final process. Um, you know, I've been looking into it for a while. Uh, I, I do want it. That, that's one of the next. Things yeah, I think that it's I, that like kind of milestone do. where you get past that point as a as a maker. That yeah, I think I, I just you can think charge three hundred dollars awesome. a piece for them too. <laughs> no, it's it's not about the money either. Uh, you know, I just like. Um, you know, I've worked in so many factories and had so, so many, uh, you know, warehouse jobs and everything that, you know, now making a living as a creative person, sitting and pouring resin and trimming it and polishing it and buffing it and everything, like, sometimes that grind becomes t- too much, uh, you know, it, it is where I'm comfortable, right? Uh, you know, coming from, uh, you know, a, a blue collar background. But sometimes like with the Safubi, it's like, I've made the sculpture. Right. And then I send it off, you make it. And then it comes back here and then I go, okay, that looks good. Right. Right. Uh, you Here's know, some airbrushing like, I would, maybe and <laughs> yeah, I would like to just start focusing on, um, the creative stuff. Uh, but you know, it's, it's not always, that's not always, um, feasible you know yeah. you still you know still end up doing your own shipping and receiving which right. I, you know i did that for a decade um so and sometimes it's that you know, you know ten dollar item that you can sell 300 of you know yeah that pays the bills at the end of the day too <laughs> i yeah that's what i say too because you know it, it, it's it's hard with with the collectors because sometimes you know, it's like an art collector. Um, oh, I've been in one of your bid wars before. <laughs> yeah, they, sometimes they get crazy. And, you know, like, um, I can't remember the guy's name. It's the 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 Facebook artist. The guy that painted the, the, the inside of uh, Facebook. Uh, anyway, he was like a graffiti artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, you know, when I was trying to sell my artwork, I would do a painting for $300 and I couldn't sell any. 
But then after he became independently wealthy, he would make a painting and he would, he would sell it. He would say, well, this is a million dollars. And he's like, and I would sell it for a million dollars. He's like, because the art collectors, they don't want a $300 painting. They want a million dollar painting. Yeah. So it's hard with the toy collectors too, because some of the toy collectors, they want an $800 Safubi. They want, you know, the, 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 the high ticket item. And then some, and then some people are like, well, I just got a bunch of garbage in my collection and, you know, I love this $10 thing. Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I see you have a acquired taste uh, oh, yeah. back there. Oh, and then there's a barbarian range. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm good friends with Chad and uh, yeah, he makes uh, amazing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he does. I'm, uh, I'm um, actually trying to get him an interview with him later on too. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he, he, we, sometimes we'll get on the phone and talk for like three hours. We're like (laughs) school girls. Uh Well, I think there's definitely, um, in this niche, especially there's a lot of us that are kind of around the same age, kind of the same interest background, you know, you know, American Mm -hmm. punk rock and, uh, Ninja Turtles and (laughs) sure. Sure. Very much so. Cross genres quite a bit and Star Wars. Yeah. Then there's always Star Wars, which is, I think yeah. when I first kind of got into your stuff was like your, uh, the bid war was one of the see through through POs or the, the, yeah. I, I still, that's my, like a, my goal in life. One of these days is to, to achieve one it, of those. It's hard when you, when, you know, I'll make so many of those and then the mold will burn out and right. then the demand is still there. And it's, it's hard to say like, yeah, I don't, I don't have any more of those, uh, you know, and well, you, I, come in, you come into an artist later in the game, like, you know, he's moved on five figures beyond that, but some of his earlier stuff, you're like, I need that in my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's sort of any artist too, yeah. you know, where, you know, you listen to someone and you're like, man, you know, what was my favorite album is the one that you made in 1977, <laughs> you know, and they're like, dude, I made 20 albums since then. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, but those, we don't like the, you know, um, so I, I, I think every artist, uh, yeah. kind of goes, goes through that, you know? Yeah. Um, what, um, hopefully I haven't peaked, hopefully yeah. see through, through <laughs> I PO was, I don't my, think so. I was um, my best. I'm, I've only seen a couple of random pages of the comic book and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I've, you know, obviously through Instagram, I've seen your kind of ongoing comic series that you've done. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing the comic books is kind of along that same, some of that same lines, but yes, the, the, I used to do like, um, four panel right, jokes right. is usually like a, joke or a fart joke or something yeah. but i wanted to take those characters and and flesh them out and see if i can't like write a story uh you know and uh that's what i did actually you can get the full comic book a free digital download if you go to my website barbarianrage.com and if you sign up uh through the newsletter okay uh, um, I'll, it's like a triggered email. Right, I'll right. send you. I'll send you a free copy of the of the full thing for nice. free. Um, well, I'll definitely put some links up in the in the stuff and okay, send people cool. your direction yeah. too. Yeah, you know, because uh, with that, you know, and I just did a Kickstarter, and uh, and I'm getting that printed right now. Um, but I want people to read it more than anything. Uh, you yeah. know, like that, that's the hard thing, like with a podcast, you know, cause I used to do a podcast for three years and people would ask me, they're like, well, how do you do a podcast? And I'm like, well, you have to do this and this and this and this. And then if that doesn't deter someone, you know, cause it's like, <laughs> you know, cause people, they just want to talk on mic, you know, right. they don't understand, like you have to do sound editing or yeah. in your case, video editing, which is, is, uh, you know, a, a whole another beast, you know? Right. Right. But you know, once they jump through those hoops, then the second question is how do I get people to listen to my podcast? And yeah. that's, that's, that's another tough, tough thing. And, you know, it's just like, uh, when I did this comic book, you know, when you're in the midst of it, it's the most important thing to you, but, People, uh, you know, people are like, yeah, well, there's already 300 other comic books on Kickstarter. You know, I've already got my pull list at the comic book shop. 
or, you know, I, I already listened to eight hours worth of podcasts a right. day. Like, where is yours going to fit in? And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's hard to grab people's attention and then hold it. Um, you know, Hoping somewhere and, between Joe Rogan and, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Bill, Bill Barr, something right in between there would be fine. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, but I mean, you know, you, you, to, at its base, you have to do this stuff for you. Right. Um, because you know, Joe Rogan was, he's, he was doing a podcast before, you know, people still, people still don't know what a podcast is. Right. Right. But you know, but back then it was like, what's a podcast, you know, I mean, it's not named after iPod. There's no, we don't like a podcast has outlived the iPod. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, like Chris Hardwick, when he started, uh, Nerdist, yeah. you know, it was just one of those things where he was like, this is one of the, one thing that I can control. Right. I can control the content. You know, it was like, I'm going out for, uh, you know, these auditions and I'm not getting any auditions. Everyone keeps thinking, you know, I'm that MTV guy <laughs> from the nineties and and he was like i started this show because it was something that i could control right. and then he made that into something huge joe rogan made it into something huge right and you know i sort of took a page out of those those books with yeah. this with my last job which there were things that were not in my control uh and it drove me crazy and i learned through the years through like podcasts and stuff how to how to make a small business and then you know, yeah. I, I finally just said, I'm, I'm out of here, uh, with my last job. So, yeah. you know, doing, doing the podcast has to come from, you know, somewhere that, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm totally off the rails here, but no, no, it, it um, works. It's all good. <laughs> but, um, you know, you have to like what you're doing. Right. Well, you know, that's why I picked toys. You, because... you have to be in, you have to be into it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just it because, you know, when, like when people say like, well, how do I get listeners? It's like, it's like you, you have to be your own listener. You right. have to, you have to listen back to it and say, would I listen to this? Yeah. You know, cause like when I first started doing a podcast, I was like, this is garbage. <laughs> And I, I like, I have to make this better. And every week, you know, I would listen back to it and I'd be like, that sucks. Take that out. Stop saying that. Stop doing that. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you have to make it interesting for yourself. So that's why, you know, like with toys, I don't make anything like if I say like, well, this is hot right now. And if I make like 20 of these, they'll sell every time I've done that and my heart's not into it it doesn't sell yeah. I, you know and i'm like well i only made this to sell them and now you're stuck here with this steaming pile of shit uh you know so uh, same thing with podcasts books yeah con- you know a- anything that you're doing you, you you have to be in it you know for yourself uh, that, that's such rudimentary advice and uh, but uh, but it's true. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's a basis for pretty much any successful project out there. Real, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. as far as on the artistic end of things, you know, you make, you make a car, you're making a car for money, obviously, but on an art, you got to do it with your heart. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you gotta be smart about it. Yeah. You gotta, you know, direction it maybe towards the right people. Mm-hmm. And if it's not working, I, you know, there's so many different things too, because it's a, it's also like, well, you have to also recognize when it's not working or, yeah. it, or if you can tweak it and then make it work or, you know, there's, there, you know, there's no roadmap for success. <laughs> what would you say your cost over enjoyment has been with this process? I don't know, man. I, I, everything costs a fortune and, you know, and then you try and sell it and, you know, even if you sell it for three hundred dollars, you're like, well, I bet might have made up for when I dropped three hundred dollars down the drain on some stupid, uh, you know, 
Darth Vader head or I, you know, whatever right. the hell that, you know, it's just that all this stuff is so expensive that like when you actually do get a hit uh, and, and people are like, Oh my God, I love this so much. It's like, well, you know, that might've covered my cost for something that I lost my ass on so long ago, you know, which brings me back to, you know, you have to like what you're doing. You have to yeah. be so into it. Um, you know, like any project that I go into, um, it has to be like the coolest thing that I've ever worked on <laughs> because once, once you start it, you know, you're in bed with this dumb project for a month, <laughs> you know, sometimes longer, you know, yeah. some people, you know, some toys, when they get a man manufactured, you know, sometimes they don't get it back for a year and a half, two years, oh, five gosh. years, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so uh, you know, and it's easy to lose sight in that time, especially yeah. if you're working, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day on it, you know, by week three, you're like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> it's ugly. It's crap. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, so you have to sort of go back and remember when you first started, like, remember how psyched you were on this project when you first started, Yeah. uh, you know, and that will see you through to the end because it, it gets, it, it's so easy to get discouraged. It's, um, you know, seeing the, the forest through the trees or, or whatever, or I, you know, I, I, I've also, I, I'm a painter as well. And I used to do portrait painting and, you know, after you spend a hundred hours painting the face, you know, I, I have to pull someone else in and I go, does that look like that person? I, I've stared at it for a hundred hours. Yeah. I don't even, you know, it just looks like a bunch of blobs. Right. Right. Um, you know, so uh, I, I don't know the, the long way back, the cost over satisfaction. I mean, it costs a fortune and you're always going to be miserable. How's that for an answer? <laughs> well, thank you for the, uh, the honesty. <laughs> I think we, there you go. well, no, you have to have some of that though, because a lot of times you do, you get yourself in a kind of a fake world of everything. Well, especially this next generation, everything I do is successful and everything I do is 100%, but the world isn't always there for you to, to keep that kind of momentum going. <laughs> no, no. What would, what's your favorite material to use? Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, when I was in eighth grade, it was probably, uh, a hot glue gun. Uh, you know, it's whatever, it's whatever's working. I mean, you know, I, like resin, I have a love hate relationship with it. You know, when it doesn't turn out, I, 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 I've, throw it against the the floor and when and when it does turn out it's like heroin you know yeah. like whoa that was really good um but you know it I've, I've been working with resin for so long you know it is time to I, you know i i found this rubber uh, and i ordered it it's not even here yet i'm like psyched on on working with that you know whatever the I mean, stuff material. you made the, the beast man head out of or different than no that? oh my god that stuff was a nightmare <laughs> uh yeah it, it's not that that was like a phone oh, okay um or you know pure chaos as i call it uh, does it expand or yeah mm -hmm. okay so, you, so it expands so you know, with, with resin, you're trying to eliminate all bubbles. Right. Right. And then with this foam, you're trying to like whip it up and whip more bubbles into it. And then you get a bubble on the surface and then, it, you know, so it's like that, that stuff was a total nightmare to work with. It It, it is fun and, and it's cool, but it's like, um, those, those beast balls. I don't know if that was the right project for, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to it in the future. Um, my favorite material is just, I, you know, I don't have a favorite material. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's what do whatever, you do most whatever you're modeling in? Uh, Sculpey, you know, uh, it's like a polymer clay. Okay. 
And, um, I mean, that's what I've worked with since high school. Right. It's right. just, you know, it's just like a, a clay. And then Have you, you played with any of the new, like epoxy clays or anything? No, you know, that stuff, it, you know, I guess it serves a purpose because you don't, uh, hang on one sec. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you don't have to, um, uh, bake it or anything, right. but you know, I work so slow you know, the last thing that I did was this little coin and it was like three days of, of sculpting on it. Right. it's like, if you use that air dry stuff, you know, sometimes it dries too quickly. Right. And right. Gets too hard to artist, sculpt uh, on. Yeah. I, I was talking to a artist, uh, Jim McKenzie, and he did this like weird carrot sculpture. And I was like, man, it's so cool. <laughs> you know, what did you use? And he was like, it's this epoxy sculpt, you know, right. and he's like, you have like t a 10 minute or like a one hour sculpt time. And he's like, I liked it because, you know, the, t the clock is ticking, yeah. you know, he's like, I got to get this done before it hardens. So, you know, there's that. And, uh, but I've used Sculpey ever since I was, a, you know, gotcha, gotcha. Um, any other other I mean we've talked a little bit about the comic, but any other projects coming up or yeah, the comic book uh that that you know I'm looking for that to sort of just like take over my entire life because I'm gonna you know it's not just a one issue, I'd like that to continue. I've already written out several issues, and um have you been able I'm to gonna, suck your brother into helping you with it or? <laughs> no, you know, he lives out here too, but he's like two, three hours away. Oh, gotcha. and he's got a, he's got a six year old, uh, out there driving him crazy. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's tough to sort of pry him away. Um, so yeah, it's the comic book. And then I have like a toy series, you know, like we were talking about Safubi. I'd like to make uh, some soft vinyl off of some of the characters from the comic book. Cool. And, you know, so it's like I'm making, I'm writing a comic book, doing all of the artwork, assembling it, publishing it, and doing <laughs> the entire toy line, you know, all single handedly. It's a, you know, it's a lot of work. Yeah, that's 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 enough stuff for now. I it's would enough, say. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, man, this has been a really good interview. Um, Thanks, man. And good talking to you. Well, I will see much more from you uh, in the near future, and uh, I know now people can uh, look back to your through your catalog of amazingness. Um, hey, yay! yay. <laughs> You put it that way. Well, it's funny. So I was like, just trying to like get a, like a starting date, like just flipping through Instagram and it just kept going and going. And you, how many posts do you normally do like a week? Do you figure? I used to try to do one, one a day. Right. Um, but I'm sort of in a transition period where it it's not just, you know, uh, three and three quarters inch toy. Here's the next toy. Here's the next right, right. toy. You know, when the pandemic hit, I had been, planning this comic book for so long that, you know, I went to designer con one year and I was like, ah, I'm doing this comic book. And then the next year I was like, well, I'm doing this comic book. And everyone's like, that's what you said last year. And I was like, Oh my God. I'm like, I'm that guy now. That's like, well, you know, I'm writing a book and it's like, well, no, you're not you loser. <laughs> um, so when the pandemic hit, I was supposed to do a show like that weekend and it got canceled and I was like, all right, the, you know, the universe is telling me it is time to, you know, sink your teeth into this comic book. And, um, I thought it would talk, take longer. I was like, by the time this comic book is over with the pandemic's going to be over with, and I'm going to take it out to the comic book conventions. And it's like, nah, you mean next year? Middle, <laughs> yeah. Still in the, yeah. Maybe, maybe by issue eight, uh, the pandemic will be over all the full line of toys. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, I used to, I used to post every day and now with the shift of, um, of, uh, putting together my comic book, it's just, uh, it's just different. So, you know, it's probably more like three or four times a week now. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, that used to be part of my business model post right. every day. Right. Um, yeah. But I, you know, that's, a, that is, a, you know, even though I don't adhere to that anymore, that's what I would say to anyone is post something every day. And I should get back into it. Um, it's kind of the 10,000 hours mentality where, you yeah. know, it takes so long to perfect something or in our case or your case, get stuff out there to enough people. Yeah. And even if it's an old post or right. a repost, it's just people seeing your name once a day. Right. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the term rebranding. Some people love it. Some people hate it with your brand or whatever. Yeah. I, you know, it's just uh, it's just a word. But, uh, you know, that is sort of what I'm doing right now is uh, is rebranding. Uh, for lack of a better term of uh, taking all of the, like the uh, retro toys or uh, the nostalgia toys right. and turning all of that into something that's totally different, uh, you know, a, a, a new universe and comic right. book and toy and everything. Well, and you were doing that nostalgia thing two years ago, whereas a lot of people are just getting into it now. So it's kind of, you've kind of grandfathered out of that where obviously you probably still have appreciation for it, but it's not sure. part of your everyday life anymore. <laughs> the thing that I think is weird is now I see like 20 year old, uh, you know, kids, right. Right. Uh, but like, uh, younger, uh, younger people that did not grow up with those toys. It's just yeah. like that. This is the uh, aesthetic now, you know, it's like, uh, the snake that is, has eaten its tail. It's just, that that's not that wasn't the starting point was their childhood is maybe that it came back and now they're replicating something you know i don't know yeah. but now it, that is just the aesthetic so yeah. i don't know it's a good spot to be i think right now i think as far as for that genre for that world it's a good sure you know, it's, it's a good spot there's a lot of there seems to be pr quite a bit of interest in it yeah well i yeah. mean even even the toys that are supposed to be on the shelf half of them are you know basically they're all throwbacks right the, uh, you know he-man and star wars and gi joe yeah I, I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I, there there's there's no <laughs> i i hate to be there there's no new ideas but you know like you turn on tv and it's like the ten thousand dollar pyramid and family right. feud and uh, right. you know like uh primetime TV is like all these game shows from the seventies, a yeah, password. Yeah. I'm like, mm, okay. But uh, so I don't know, <laughs> trying something new uh, with the, this, this comic book, I, you know, I got one foot in the new and one foot, uh, you know, in the old. So, you know, it, it, it has been spawned from nostalgia, but it, in my opinion, I think it's something I'm trying something new. So. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's good stuff. Barbarian no, right. rage has always been kind of a separate thing for, it, it seemed like even with your artwork, like that was always kind of a separate mentality from the, 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 the one-offs or the, you know, mm, yeah. <laughs> Cause you had like your yeah. blood brain and stuff like that, where it was, yeah. you know, that obviously. That was came my, from, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was Mike Diana. He's, um, He's a comic book artist. He's the only American artist that has gone to jail uh, over his artwork. Oh, wow. There's a, <laughs> there's a documentary about it called uh, Boiled Angels. Okay. And okay. Uh, he, he got put on trial for obscenity um, in his uh, comic book, uh, Boiled Angel. And um, they found him guilty and they, they put him in jail. So anyway, that's a fascinating movie. Go check that out. And, uh, he, he's a friend of mine and I've been a fan, you know, yeah. forever. So, all, all right. right. I think well, my phone is about to die. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're wrapping this up. Um, all right. like I said, it's been a pleasure, sir. Uh, thank you. Pleasure's any questions for my world or yeah. What's the next project you're up to, man? Well, I saw you made um, like the speaker. Uh, so uh, that was just getting the studio set up. Okay, cool. Um, the motorcycle is definitely on process. And then awesome. um, I'm doing going to be streaming some making of my own as far as for some model work that I have uh, lined up. 
I need cool. to take your advice and start smaller maybe and uh, work on some of those projects. Uh, I call it I, reasonable goals, man. Yeah. Set reasonable, attainable goals. Well, the part of uh, the podcast was a big part of it. Yeah. Um, it's something I've been kind of toying with in my head for a while. Cause I also sure. like you listen to Hardwick and some of those from mm -hmm. the beginning. And it's one of those yeah. things like, I think I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, th and that's uh yeah. Yeah. And then you talk to experts and then you pick their right. brain and then you go and then you implement that into your own work. Right. Right. And um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Right. Well, I look forward to seeing more of your work, dude. Yeah. Good deal. Nice meeting you. All right, man. All Thanks right. for watching we'll Test Plug. All right. We'll see you later.